These are the words of God. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us cross to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and, they sa- and they, as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came up on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? Look, there are many things that scare me in life. Spiders, snakes, sharks, surgery, all kinds of things scare me. But what about the things that truly terrify us or have truly terrified us in the past? Um, I don't have to dig very deep uh, in my own experience to reach for something that was truly terrifying or terrifying experience that I've been through. Uh, for example, at a young age, I remember floating on uh, one of those lilos, those inflatable beds on a swimming pool. I was very young. I didn't know how to swim yet. And sure enough, I fell off in the deep end. I was on the lilo, and I fell off in the deep end. In a panic, I grabbed my older brother around his neck, pushing him under the water, just to stay above the waterline myself. In the end, we did scramble to safety, but to this day, it remains a terrifying memory. What we're thinking about this morning is also a terrifying experience, where life seemed to be hanging in the balance. And we're asking the question, where is Jesus when I'm terrified? When it feels like my life is about to be undone, where is Jesus when I am terrified? As we set out, we are going to encounter a miracle, Jesus calming a storm. And I'd like to make a comment or two about miracles. See, some of our friends and neighbors think miracles are an obstacle to their faith. They believe miracles are an obstacle to their belief in God. They might say, we can't trust the Bible's account of history and Jesus' life because the Bible speaks favorably about miracles. And miracles belong to unsophisticated minds and outdated superstition. That is to say, some of our searching but suspicious friends may not believe in a supernatural presence or power that is able to touch our world. So a Bible passage in which Jesus miraculously, supernaturally, changed the weather seems hard to believe. I don't have a quick answer that would satisfy every suspicion about Jesus, the Bible, or the claims of miracles. But I would ask you to consider this. When Luke put pen to paper, recording all the things that he carefully researched about Jesus, we get the impression from a person like Luke, as we've been reading through Luke from verse 1 right up to this point, we, we are starting to settle into a picture that Luke is the kind of guy who's eager to present to us the facts. He's done his research, and he's just here to present the facts 
as they are. Remember, right at the start of his book, he said to his own sponsor, he said, even though many have undertaken to compile a narrative of Jesus' life, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Luke tells us really early on what his stated goal is. And he tells us he's not out to write fantasy. This is not the purpose of his account of Jesus' life. It's not a fantasy story filled with made-up people and magic and imaginary places. This is not fiction like the Lord of the Rings. Rather, Luke has labored tirelessly to give an orderly account, a well-researched account of Jesus' life. And he was careful to do so with great accuracy, routinely naming his sources, his eyewitnesses, the people who were actually there. And he would routinely pinpoint the places that events took place in. He named cities, towns, lakes, and rivers that you can still visit to this very day. All up, we discover Luke was motivated to give a focused presentation of the facts supported by real evidence in the real world. So whatever our lingering suspicions about Jesus, the Bible, and miracles, it would just seem rather hasty to dismiss all of Luke's writings including his record of Jesus calming a storm, as an inaccurate creative fiction or a theatrical embellishment. Quite the opposite. When we read Luke, Luke from cover to cover, we come away with a very strong impression that he was presenting the facts of what happened on that lake that day. So come to the event itself. Let's go to the event itself. Luke told us that Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, setting sail for the other side of the lake. Again, this happened in a real place. This is the sea or the lake of Galilee. You can Google it. You can still visit it to this day. And the geography of the lake is really unusual. It is one of the most remarkable but most unusual places to go visit in the world. The lake itself sits about 200 meters below sea level. It's, if you travel in Israel, you've got land, and then it sort of dips into this valley where the Sea of Galilee sits, about 200 meters below sea level, surrounded by steep hills, which produce these intensely violent and sudden localized forms. Um, many, many years ago, um, I, um, I managed to go visit there, and I remember standing on one of those hills, and there was a, a flag um, right on the cliff, right on the edge of the hill, but the flag was absolutely wrecked. It was just threads blowing in the wind, and it just gives you this strong impression of how fierce those winds can be when they do come off those hills and onto the lake. And this is exactly what happened when the disciples crossed from one side of the lake to the other. The text says that Jesus was sleeping when a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. One thing we want to keep in mind as we, re as we read an account like this is that many of these disciples who were sailing with Jesus were experienced fishermen. They're not rookies. This is not their first time on a boat. They are experienced fishermen. This is not their first rodeo. They've been on that lake countless of times, and they know what it takes to weather a storm. But even these storm-hardened fishermen realized that this storm, this kind of storm was getting the better of them. There was a real chance that they were going to lose that boat 
if not their very lives. That real experienced fishermen knew that real danger had come upon them. And in this terrifying panic, they really wanted Jesus to acknowledge or at least show some discomfort with the gravity of the situation. Jesus is sleeping in the boat. The disciples are in a panic, and they just want Jesus to acknowledge, Jesus, something really bad is going on here. Wake up. Master, Master, we are perishing. That is the gravity of their predicament. Look, I don't know if you've ever been out on a boat in stormy conditions, or even just slightly choppy conditions, <laughs> uh, with an experienced captain, with an experienced fisherman. But it seems that they have a much higher tolerance for danger than us land lovers. They just do. They just know how to handle things in a way that we don't. But even here, their experienced, danger-tolerant fishermen knew the storm was more than they could handle. They were, in fact, helpless. They know it. They are helpless. Master, master, we are perishing. Time had come for them to call. Mayday, mayday, we are going under. And no doubt this amounts to a terrifying experience. I can, you can just imagine being out on that boat and it's just so choppy, so windy. The boat's filling up with water and you're like, no, there's no way we're going to make this. We're not going to make it. The disciples believe their very lives were in danger. They may well be asking, where is Jesus? While we are terrified, doesn't he care for us? Isn't he concerned for our safety? And look, that's a very fair question to ask, isn't it? Perhaps if you think about the things that have terrified you most in life, it may have been a question that you yourself have asked. Where is Jesus? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he care for my safety? It's a very natural thought or question to have. Jesus, however, was right there. Jesus was right there. He is in the storm with the disciples. And this is what Luke wanted us to know. Jesus awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. And they ceased. And there was a calm and in an almost puzzling way, Jesus asked his disciples, Where, where is your faith? Other accounts of this event bring out a level of detail which Luke did not include. In Matthew's account, Jesus said, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? In Mark's account, Jesus said, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? The puzzling thing here is not the slight variances we have in Jesus' question, but the fact that Jesus put the question about faith to distraught fishermen in the first place. That's the thing that's puzzling about all of it. It's not that, um, that these eyewitnesses gave slightly different um, expressions of how Jesus asked the question. It's the fact that he brings up the question of faith in the midst of this event. What other, I mean, the, the, the reason it's puzzling, because we're asking, what other response did Jesus expect? What did Jesus actually expect from the disciples? Their, their lives were on the line. They were in dire straits, 
Did Jesus really expect them to remain calm and carry on as though nothing scary was happening? Is that what we imagine in Jesus' question? That they should have just been okay with the situation? Look, I don't know the full intent of Jesus' expectation from his disciples. I don't even know the full intent of Jesus' question here. It is just a difficult question to put your mind to. Like, why, why is he asking that question? But I was helped by a comment from one commentator, Dale Ralph Davis. He wrote an excellent, excellent commentary on, on Luke, and he, said, he suggested Jesus' question might have been designed to give the disciples a moment to reflect and consider. Since Jesus was there, nothing could really harm them. If Jesus was in the boat with them, that should count for something. I think he's right. I, th I think this is getting at the right um, idea here of why Jesus would ask the question. The disciples have spent a bit of time with Jesus by now. They've already seen him do things to the natural world that suggest he was an extraordinary person. They've already seen Jesus manipulate the natural world in such a way that there should be some kind of trigger in their mind going, this Jesus is unusual. He, he's capable of doing things that other people are not. If you remember when some of his fishermen turned disciples first started following him, Jesus provided a miraculous catch of fish that the early disciples ended up with more fish than their boats could carry. That is, they've already seen and experienced a glimpse of Jesus' authority over the natural world. And if so, was it not possible that Jesus could do the same again? I mean, if they've seen it before, isn't it, is it not at least within the realm of possibility that 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 could be repeated again. Maybe that's all that Jesus was trying to get at in his question. Where is your faith? As the terrifying and unsettling panic passes, Jesus gently called them back to sanity, to remembrance, to assurance that he is actually still there and can still be trusted in their moment of greatest need. But this also brings us to another question. Remember what the disciples have just seen. They have just witnessed Jesus instructing wind and waves what to do, and those winds and waves obeyed him. Just imagine that happening to you. Just imagine yourself some 2,000 years back in a boat on Galilee, and the person you're sailing with speaks to the wind and to the waves, and they obey him. Now, that's unusual. I've seen some people make a coin disappear behind someone's ear. I've seen someone tr um, do some very clever card tricks. But this... This, telling the wind and the, and the waves what to do, and they obey, that is just beyond impressive. That is beyond impressive. That's off the charts. That's the kind of thing that registers with you as out of this world. I mean, who does that? Who goes out and speaks to the wind and the waves, and they obey him? Who has that kind of power? To do that, it's out of this world, and here's why. Every disciple in that boat would have known that the natural world belongs to God. They're, they're mostly from Jewish backgrounds, right? And they've 
been in synagogues since, um, since they were in nappies. They've heard the stories about who God is and what God can do and what God is like. They for sure know that the natural world belongs to God and is under his control. They knew God parted waters in the Red Sea through which their forefathers escaped Egypt, as their Bibles clearly taught them that God commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They also knew that God alone has the power to subdue storms. It is God and God alone who's the, who has this kind of power. The psalmist said, He made the storms be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. That is what the disciples truly knew about God. They knew this rightly about God. And yet here they were with Jesus, wielding the exact same power that God does. They know God can tell the storms what to do. But this is Jesus. And Jesus is wielding the exact same power as God. And that is a lot to take in if you were a disciple on a boat. That is a lot to comprehend. And to their credit, the disciples were trying to figure this out. They were asking a very good question. Who then is this? Who then is this? That he commands even the winds and the water. And they obey him. That is a great question to be asking if you were in the boat as the disciples were. Who, who is this guy? Who is he? just told the waves and the wind what to do and they did it. Who is he? That is the question of the hour. Slowly but surely, these disciples were given opportunities to wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus is God. Slowly but surely, that thought begins to concretize in their minds that Jesus is God. We, on the other hand, stand on the shoulders of giants. We don't have to start from the very beginning. We get to jump on board with these basic Christian convictions already settled and not up for dispute. Take a look at this quote from Origen. This is an um, old saint write, writing around 200 AD, early, early, early on in the history of the church. He said, although Christ was God, he took flesh. And having been made man, he remained what he was, God. Or take a more modern explanation. Pastor David Mathis writes, mysterious though it may be, Jesus has two complete natures, one fully human and one fully divine. Two natures are united in one person, the God-man. And this is exactly the testimony of these scriptures. This is what we find in our text. Jesus slept. Jesus was sleeping. He wasn't pretending. He was sleeping. He was doing what every other human being does have to do, sleep. And that is evidence of his fully human nature. But Jesus also controls the wind and the waves, just as God does. And this is evidence of his fully divine nature. So the disciples and the church eventually settled on the conviction that Jesus is complete in Godhead and complete in manhood. Truly God and truly man, two natures, without confusion, 
without change, without division, without separation. Two complete and full natures brought together in one person. You know, theologians call this the hypostatic union, and we might think this was just a whole exercise in being too nerdy and too academic or a bit of a tangent to the text itself. But not so. I don't bring this up to make you think that I'm a clever guy. I'm not. I bring this up because to put our finger on a, defi on a definition like this, explaining how Jesus slept yet controls the sea, is to affirm that Jesus was more than an interesting ethicist or a philosopher or a teacher in human history. He's not less, but he is more. And though it's mysterious to us, with his human nature and limitations to eat, sleep, and rest, he has a divine nature and power to subdue the winds and the waves. It is right for us to make definitions like this. And because he is able to subdue the winds and the waves, the disciples must now also recognize that this is actually who's on the boat with them. The teacher that they knew is the God who controls the winds and the waves. But now look at this. E even if that thought dawns on them, even if some of them are starting to, to trigger, uh, uh, we should budget for more about Jesus than what meets the eye. Um, there, there's another thing going on here. I'm sure we'd all agree that the storm would have been a terrifying and scary experience to go through. You're being tossed about in a boat on a lake. You're taking on water. You're thinking you're going to drown. Yep, that is scary. That is terrifying. But notice when the text brings up the fact that the disciples were afraid. Notice when the text actually spells it out for us that they were afraid. They were afraid after Jesus calmed the storm. They were afraid after Jesus calmed the storm. It's such a small detail that it almost escaped my, my attention altogether. Verse 25, it says that Jesus had calmed the storm and then, Jesus had calmed the storm and then they were afraid and they marveled saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? We might assume that the disciples were afraid ever since the storm started. But why was Luke making such a point of saying that they were afraid after Jesus settled the storm? Why is that such a point to make? Could it be that it is perhaps more scary, more terrifying to be near Jesus once you catch a glimpse of understanding that he is God? That in a crystallizing moment, you realize Jesus is not just an interesting religious figure, an ethicist or philosopher of history, that you may casually and endlessly poke and prod and examine from the comfort of your favorite chair or podcast but that he is unique. He is God. And if the winds and the waves obey him, isn't it about time that we did as well? Let me draw this to a close with a few applications for us. Firstly, it would be a twisting of the text to suggest that Jesus promises his disciples a stormless or a terror-free life. Nor does this text promise us a safe boat trip for all Christians. But when terrifying experiences come our way, we are no less alone from God 
than the disciples were from Jesus. He is still there. Secondly, when terrifying experiences come our way and we do feel overwhelmed, it is good for us to learn from the disciples. Don't be afraid to call out to Jesus. Make your situation known to him. Appeal to him. Shout if you have to. What matters is that you call on him in your desperate and helpless moments. Thirdly, maybe you're thinking that the terrifying experience you are currently in or the one that you might have to face in the future will simply overwhelm your faith. Maybe you fear reacting just like the disciples initially did. Panicked, not trusting, unbelieving that Jesus could bring realistic help. And Jesus would gently ask, who or what are you trusting in right now? Where is your faith being placed upon? Slowly, with a question like that, Jesus will bring sanity back to your mind, stabilize you. And then you may be able to count on Jesus as a faithful ally and savior, capable of quieting your terrifying storm. And that that thought may not be so outrageous as you first imagined going into the situation. I'll close for us with a story of Horatio Spafford. He was a well-to-do lawyer in the 1800s. One year after his only son died, a fire destroyed almost all his real estate assets. Hoping to bring some cheer to his family, he decided to take them overseas to hear a very famous preacher and evangelist, D.L. Moody, speak. But before boarding their ship, he was held up on a business matter. And so he sent his wife and daughters ahead of him, hoping to catch up with them on the next ship. Then, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, their boat sunk. His four daughters died, and his wife survived. She managed to send him a short telegram with only two words on it. Saved alone. That would be a terrifying experience that so few of us would even begin to imagine being in. Spafford boarded a ship to be reunited with his wife and sailing over the spot where his daughters likely drowned, he penned the now famous hymn, When Peace Like a River. And he wrote these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. We're not saying that trusting Jesus will insulate us from a difficult and trialing life. What we are saying is that it is possible to reach a point of trusting Jesus in difficult and trialing situations. It is possible to answer the question, where is Jesus when I am terrified? With the words, he is here. It is well with my soul.